Hi there, my name is Antoinette Londijan, and I am delighted to be here today with Mark Hutchins, COO of Shatsi. Uh, Mark is, has been in the industry for uh, long enough to understand the different ebbs and flows of the trade, and I am thrilled to be, have the opportunity to sit here and enjoy the presentation that Mark is bringing to us, but also to ask a couple of questions. But before we do that, Mark, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, my name is Mark Hutchins. I'm CEO of Shotzi Wines, a company based in New York. Uh, and we, I personally, and and my colleagues, uh, my colleague, the founder of Shotzi, Kevin Pike, have been working with uh, Johannes Lights, really the the subject of our conversation today, in in regards to his non-alcoholic wines, the zero wines. Uh, we've been working together for many decades. In fact, I met Johannes Lights. Uh, in the late 90s, the first vintage I tasted uh, from cask with Johannes was the 1997 vintage. So I think that would have put me in, in Rudesheim in Germany uh, in 1998. So we've been working together for a very, very long time. And when I, when I first met Johannes, actually, he was a minuscule winery with, I think, less than three hectares in total uh, as a property. So very, very small at that time, unknown. And over the decades, he's grown now to be really the largest uh, still family-owned winery in the Rheingau. He owns now over 60 hectares, and he contracts, uh, especially because of the growth of the Light Zero, he contracts for now for over 100 hectares of, of fruit um, in total with his 60 hectares. So he's become really a very important property in the Rheingau. And... Um, and beginning in 2016, uh, endeavored to make very, very high quality uh, non-alcoholic wine. Um, and it's absolutely fitting for reasons I hope to have time to explain today that Johannes Lights in the Rheingau um, started to do this was really one of the, the we like to say the granddaddies of, of this category of wine. Because the Rheingau in particular has a very, very long history of, of distillation, of both for brandy and actually for vacuum distillation for dealkalizing uh, wine. Uh, so, so yeah, so we go a long way back with uh, Johannes. We started importing the the at Shotzi, the zero wines in in 2018. Uh, after he had already started, and it's just become, as as you know, an explosive category uh, globally and uh, especially in the United States. Wonderful. I know you have a a couple of slides uh, to show us. Let's go ahead and jump right into those. Yeah. So I think we can't really understand, or it helps to understand the the growth of this in Germany in particular because of the technology. But in order to do that, I think it's 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 interesting also to take a look at the Rheingau itself and why the Rheingau exists uh, in particular. And so I'm going to share uh, some things here to, because I'm a I like maps and uh, photographs of the vineyards. But but the Rheingau in particular, let's understand the Rheingau. The Rhine, as we all know, creates the border between France and Germany. Uh, here the and we'll talk more at the end when we talk about our Pinot Noir from Baden. And here on the other side of the Rhine, Alsace. And this is really in Germany the warmest, driest part of of uh, of Germany because of because of the both the Black Forest, the the Vosges mountain range, keep this a very protected and very dry area. And mind you, the, the Rhine is flowing north here. And as it flows north past the faults, past the Rheinhessen, right around Wiesbaden, the Rhine River hits an obstacle, a ge geographic obstacle called the Taunus mountain range. And it it the Taunus force the Rhine, the Rhine River to flow west for only about 20 miles. And that 20 miles, the north, it produces what is, is an absolutely idyllic uh, or ideal exposition for vineyards. Uh, and again, this green shaded area here um, is, is what we call the Rheingau. And then, and then just past Rudesheim, which is the village where Johannes Lights is from and based and most of his vineyards are in. 
the Rhine, it gets past its obstacle and starts flowing north again, uh, up through Bacharach and into the Middle Rhine region. So this is the Rheingau. And what, what we don't understand about the Rheingau often is how small it is. This 20 miles is really just over 3,000 hectares. So it's actually one of the smallest Appalachians in Germany, even, but it's quite famous in our own mind. We have a, a, a long history of recognizing Rheingau as, as amongst Germany's finest wines. Uh, and in fact, the word hawk wine in the English language comes from the wines that would have shipped out of Hochheim uh, here in for many, many centuries ago. It was already famous. German wine was already famous in the English speaking language in English speaking countries, especially um, Britain, as hawk wine, hawk wine. And that comes from Hochheim. And so this area is is already quite famous, but very, very small. Um, and then the village of Rudesheim here, this is where the Rhine River flows north again. And this is where many of Johannes's vineyards are co come from, his, his wines. That isn't to say that uh, the zero, the non-alcoholic come from here, but I wanted to show you this slide uh, from across the river because the village of Rudesheim down here, which is where Johannes is based, is also home to some very, very important distillation. And what's in, what we want to point out with the light zero is that the, the, the process of removing the alcohol from the wines is a process of vacuum distillation. And the first patent for that in Germany uh, came from the village of Rudesheim, from, from Carl Jung, uh, Weingut Carl Jung. And um, that is still where uh, the light zero wines uh, go through their their alcohol removal process, and it's a very gentle process. We like we think at this point, with the technology that we've investigated, that this is the 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 best way to dealkalize that retains the the character and identity, the vinous character of the non-alcoholic wine. It's very gentle, and I'll explain that more. But that starts in the village of Rudesheim here, and now distillation in particular has a long history here. Um, those that are those of you that are my age in the industry, which is to say over three decades, might remember a German brandy called Asbach Oralt. Unfortunately, it no longer exists as a commercial enterprise. But when I was starting up in the business, you could still buy Asbach Oralt, aged brandy from here. Remember, the French and the Germans haven't always gotten along. So there will be periods in history where they would not have been able to import cognac or armagnac. And so it became important for the Germans as well to have their own brandy making. And Asbach Oralt is arguably the most famous, one of the most famous of that type. And right across the street from Asbach Oralt is Carl Jung, and this is the winery, and this is based, this this vineyard you see right behind them, um, is is part of that Rudesheimer Berg that I that I showed you earlier. This is actually what we call the Berg Rotland Hinterhaus, a great great famous Grand Cru, uh, or Grosses Gewächs as the Germans say from from there. So you're right in the heart of the Rudesheimer Berg, and right in the heart of the old village of Rudesheim. Literally, I'm almost standing in the same place from the photograph I took of Asbach Uralt and here Carl Jung. And Herr Jung, uh, from generations ago, was the first to get a patent for vacuum distillation. And in fact, here's a photograph I took this summer of Mr. Jung holding a, an etching of his, his uh, patent uh, from, from in this case, the US patent was given in 1908. And so I bring that up because a lot of us, and, and I did as well when we first started doing this, I thought this was new technology. I thought it was a new idea to be perfectly honest, like many of us in the wine business, I thought it was a fetish that would pass quickly. And how could, how could this one, how could this be good? And two, why would anyone want to do it? And of course, now I know so much better why, thankfully. Um, but in fact, it's a very, it's very old technology, over a hundred years old in, in the Rheingau. And it's not even a new idea in the United States. In fact, Young was selling uh, dealkalized wine to the United States during prohibition already. Uh, and in fact, that business, that revenue stream during prohibition was potentially one of the reasons that the winery remains as successful as it is. It was a big 
a windfall of financial resource that came to them from the United States at that time. And they've continued to do this. And, and it's only now uh, in, in that, that it's become so important. Um, and uh, but anyway, and here's light. So let's take a break from the the slides and maybe talk a little bit more about the the technology itself and maybe why Johannes Lights started to do dealkalized wine in the first place. Absolutely, it's uh, people like Johannes who have really uh, allowed non-alcoholic wine to become accessible and streamlined to serious wine drinkers in the trade. And uh, it's just amazing to see the quality of the wines produced and the ver the large variation of different uh, choices in the different bottlings that he makes. Yeah, so, so exactly. Johannes and Johannes started doing this in 2016 really for two reasons. One, he was ordered by his doctor to, to limit or eliminate his alcoholic consumption, alcohol consumption, really because uh, of, a, of a heart condition uh, that he had that required that. But also at around the same time, uh, Johannes does a, a, a really important amount of business in in uh, Northern Europe and Scandinavian countries and in Norway in particular, the uh, where he does business directly with a number of, of important Michelin uh, starred chefs. Johannes uh, was asked to make de-alkalized wine, alcohol removed wine of a similar quality to what they had grown to expect from him, from his regular wines from the Rudesheimer Berg. And the reason in Norway in particular this is important is because the, the penalties for driving under the influence are exorbitant. In fact, if I understand correctly, uh, a DUI in Norway, it, the penalty is 10% of one's income. There is no fixed penalty for this. It, so the wealthier you are, the more you pay for driving drunk. And as you can imagine, restaurants of this type, um, the, the diners there could suffer a pretty important penalty for their... Uh, for getting a DUI. And so they became really, and as you know, in particular with, with restaurants of that stature, pairings, they're really very much about pairings. And the wines, very often you walk in and you're guided through the wines with the cuisine uh, without the choice. And and what, what a, a, a growing number of chefs are really insisting on, and I remember when this was happening, uh, if, for example, in, in, in Chicago with all of the pairing restaurants, at first they were pairing beers and they were pairing sake. And now they really also want to be able to pair non-alcoholic beverages, both whether they're mocktails or, or non-alcoholic cocktails and uh, wines, non-alcoholic beers, et cetera. So the non-alcoholic tasting menu is growing in importance. And so Johannes really started doing this and it, it, it for by popular demand. And it was only appropriate that this happened in the village of Rudesheim, where the first patent for this technology existed of, of vacuum distillation. Is there um, an, a chance that you might be able to give us uh, an insider scoop on how uh, difficult or not it is to use vacuum distillation to make the quality of wine that, that Johannes is making over at Lights? No, well, sh yeah, I'll share some slides in a moment to sh give, give some images about the technology itself and how the vacuum distillation uh, works with the wine. But in terms of the difficulty of doing it, it really ties to the quality of the wine that goes in in the first place. And as this category of wine, a species uh, of wine is, is growing at such an important rate, a lot of new entries into the category are really just using bulked out wine. It's important for your customers to understand that these wines should not be less expensive than regular wine. In fact, the process itself loses 15 to 20% of the original volume of wine in the first place. So that already increases the cost of the wine going into it. Uh, and then um, and then the process itself, of course, is laborious. And so there's an expense involved in, in doing the dealkalization in the first place. So there's no reason, all other things being equal, that the same quality level of wine would be any less expensive as an, as a, as an alcohol-removed wine versus a regular 
a regular wine. And so that's important to understand. Thankfully, what we're finding from this part of the industry is that consumers are more than happy to spend similar or more or higher amounts uh, per bottle for high quality alcohol removed wine. And this is beautiful. And it's also statistically already trade groups are proving that this uh, this level of business or this type of business is not cannibalizing uh, alcoholic wine consumption. In fact, 80% of the time a dealkalized wine is purchased retail in the United States, it's being purchased with alcoholic wine at the same time or, or, or alcoholic beer or some other form of alcoholic. So, so this is not cannibalizing the, uh, the regular part of our industry. It's a complementary thing. But what matters most really is the is the quality of the raw material going in. And this is why one of the reasons why Johannes Leitz has really excelled at, at, at creating non-alcoholic wine is because he's he's growing and sourcing very, very high quality fruit. And uh, whereas a, uh, you can, for example, buy wine from anywhere in the EU or even outside of it and have it have it dealkalized uh, under these processes uh, for for very little money that you can buy something from from Southern Europe, you can buy something from North Africa, you can buy fruit from Spain or Portugal, where the bulk market for those wines is significantly lower than in Germany or in France. Or I, I'm proud to be uh, doing this with you on the heels of Gießen and Naughty. Uh, uh, you know, those the 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 bulk market for the for wines from those origins is 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 not as low as it is from from some other origins and those origins are very often going into um into what into this growing thing so as as new entries come in uh it's 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 important to understand that the difficulty in this starts with origin and i'll talk more about that later um because it's really one of the hallmarks of the way we're working with the non-alcoholic category but first let me um, share some images of the of the distillation process itself. Just for your, just so you know who we're talking about. That's Johannes Leitz standing up, I believe, in one of the amphitheaters in the Rosenek uh, on the Rudesheimer Berg that I showed you earlier. But this is a vacuum still. Um, this is an older one from the 1970s. Young also has some newer ones that that I was able to see. Um, they didn't. Uh, they they didn't want me to take any photographs of those at this point uh, for sharing anyway, because the technology is advancing and they're really one of the important players. In fact, they're they're helping to influence uh, and design the the direction of the vacuum distillation. And so it's a little bit secret. But this still, what you can't see here is that it goes ten meters up into the ceiling. And basically, what's happening here is we're we're heating the wine up, but we're able to do it under intense vacuum pressure. If you think also of a pressure cooker, for example, and how you, when you pressure cook something, you're able to do, to, for example, if you're doing a, a protein in a pressure cooker, you can get to the point of tenderness much, much more rapidly than you would uh, through a normal brazing method, for example, where there's no vacuum pressure. So vacuum pressure really changes the way in which something um, something something works uh, in the cooking process. And I wouldn't call this a cooking process, but we're able under intense vacuum pressure to distill the alcohol out at, at a much lower temperature. In fact, um, here's alcohol pure alcohol coming out of it. Wait, I think I skipped a slide, unfortunately. Let's go back. There. This So this image shows you in Celsius, this is an active distillation in process. And I can put my hand anywhere on the still, uh, maybe except for where the heat source itself is. I can put my hand anywhere on the still here. And you can see that the alcohol is being removed here at just over 30 degrees Celsius. Whereas a normal alcoholic fermentation, if you're making gin or brandy or whiskey or something like that, we're going to be in excess of 80 degrees uh, Celsius, depending on what we're making. So we're working at, at significantly less than half of the, the temperature. And what that allows is first, Obviously, the carbon dioxide is going to leave, but then all of the aromatic and flavor components of the wine itself can be captured uh, from the still. And then once the alcohol is completely removed, then we have 
what is no longer wine, but is the base liquid, we reintroduce the the flavor components back into the wine. And because it's been done at a significantly lower temperature, we preserve more of the character. Uh, I suspect your customers, because of the education that you're doing, already understand at a certain level what this process is. But um, that's really kind of the way the, the the technology works. Oh, we don't have to get into those. Those they can see all those pictures on your. They can see the bottles on your on your shelves. <laughs> that's right. Um, we're very happy to be um, able to carry everything that we can get our hands on from Light. So um, Lights has been with me personally as a, a consumer of the product, uh, the Riesling uh, and the sparkling Riesling for the last three years. So I'm always Thank delighted you. and thrilled when finally something is back in stock because apparently there's just such a great demand for the the wines that or non-alcoholic wines that they're always um, running out. And that's the best sign possible, uh, especially for, for this sector of the portfolio. And you can blame us in part for that, but also really just the 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 exponential growth. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm in my I'm believe I'm actually in my 34th year in the business and I've never seen a rate of growth for any category of wine the way we have this. And so for example in 2022 we grew over 200% this year. I think we'll finish the year 60% over last year. So it's it's it is hard to keep continuity with that rate of growth but we're we're managing it. So it's and and I, your client your customers should really take that as an indication that there's really something important here. Um and as as they start to investigate this and try different things, I would I would suggest paying a, for us we have a we have a kind of an, an important philosophical position about this because we all come from the wine industry johannes is a wine grower he's a fine wine grower quite famous grower in the rheingau uh at shotzi we're all veteran fine wine industry people we're not coming into de-alkalized wine as a beverage we're coming into it as wine and one of the things that will continue to distinguish lights in the category of non-alcoholic wine is, and we're we're putting more and more effort and more and more investment into being able to do this and 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 maintain this distinction in what we do, is that the wines are going to be considered wines the same way we do fine wine of any other type, which is to say that we value origin and specificity of origin above almost all things. And and when you when we spend more money on wine, when we focus more on wine, we 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 think about where it comes from and the appellation. We spend more money for a wine from a specific crew in Burgundy or a, a specific village in in the Côte d'Iron, uh, for example. And and thank let's thank the French for really more or less being the inventors of the concept of appellation. But for my whole career and many of us, the concept of appellation isn't just rhetorical. It's 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 critically important to placing value in wine. And our philosophy about the light zero is that is that we can approach it the same way, and we want to be distinguished from the ever increasing amount of brands in this in in the non-alcoholic sector um by being a wine of of specific origin and if i may show you just a couple more slides very quickly i want to focus in particular on our pinot noir because the pinot noir after the riesling um the pinot noir has um really become the best selling wine that we do and it's much more difficult to do red wine as a non-alcoholic um than white in our experience but the the it's it's also the wine of the right now of the most specific origin. So if I may, our Pinot Noir comes when I when I showed you the map of oops I just about left the meeting. I want to screen share. Uh, wrong red button. Uh, let me get quickly here. When I mentioned earlier the Rhine dividing the part of Germany which is Baden and the part of France which is Alsace, right in there near Freiburg is a very famous. Uh, extinct volcano called the Kaiserstuhl, the Kaiserstuhl, the 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 Kaiser's uh, throne, and this area is really one of the most famous for Pinot Noir. 
And it looks like this. It's an absolutely idyllic, beautiful looking area with terraced vineyards in the volcanic soils. And um, this is a vineyard, uh, one of the vineyards that contributes to our Pinot Noir, so you can get a better sense of that. And we have a really strong relationship with the co-op in Irrigan, uh, which is a co-op of uh, approximately 300 growers from the Kaiserstuhl in particular, and the Tunaberg just, um, just below that, uh, but mostly the Kaiserstuhle. And um, we have a great relationship there, and we now source 100% of our Pinot Noir by tasting through casks. They have one of the largest uh, cask cellars in uh, in Europe at this point. With, and and they, they, the élevage for the Pinot Noir happens in, in these casks. And we go through and we taste and 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 uh, and I for the first time I just did a, a, a reorganization of our labels and for the first time early next year I'm going to be importing Pinot Noir, uh, the light zero Pinot Noir alcohol removed and on the back label we're going to say this wine is sourced 100% from the Kaiserstuhl in Baden, Baden Germany, and I'm very proud of this fact because and I want to eventually navigate all of our sourcing to come from as often as we can to come from sp specific places so that we can conceive of non-alcoholic wine or dealkalized wine in the same way that we do regular wine. And in our opinion, there's absolutely no reason that we can't. Um, and so this is this is this is part of the direction we're going and we're hoping that that that's included in the evolution of this category. Uh, that that it it isn't just a beverage. It's it's going to it can stay wine with all of the the romanticism that we associate with wine can be included in that. That's right, and I think that will be a journey that uh, will be a pleasure to take with people such as yourself guiding the way and uh, sharing important information, not only historical information, but also current as to what the winemakers are doing, how they're doing it, and what the terroir means for each individual wine. Uh, the wine industry is uh, no less than obsessed uh, with places of origin, and you're absolutely right, this is no different. Um, before we say goodbye to everyone, uh, are there any last comments you'd like to share with us? No, I I think that I well I hope I didn't talk too much. I know we might have run over a, a typical twenty minute video. So I I I just thank you for if anyone who's watched and made it this far, thank you for listening and thank you for doing this. I think it's amazing the way that you use this resource and you you sell through education. This is this is really important because wine is such a huge diverse category and it's something that even old veterans like me can continue to learn from uh, all the time. So yeah, thank you for doing it. Thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you for your attention. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. A pleasure. And I look forward to uh, connecting again with you in a couple of years to review how this has developed. Uh, thanks again. Thank you. Bye.